joy of being in a place called American Beach. Jump in the waves, playing in the sand dunes. We came to American Beach because that's what we did every weekend that we could. I'm Johnetta Betch Cole. I can't remember when American Beach wasn't a part of my life. The place where my great-grandfather, Abraham Lincoln Lewis, had the vision to purchase land, to declare it a place where, in the middle of segregation, legal segregation, black folk could not go to white folks' beaches. He declared it a human right for black folk to have recreation without humiliation. So I was Abraham Lincoln Lewis's baby granddaughter and my sister, that extraordinary force of nature, the beach lady, Marvin, Oshun, Betch, my mom, Mary, Francis, Lewis Betch, my dad, John, Thomas, Betch, senior until my baby brother came into the world. We would just pack up into the car after church. How well I remember church. It seemed to go on all day long on Sunday. But I knew that at the end of that, of that service, we would either go to A.L. Lewis's home for Sunday dinner or we'd come to the beach. It was possible some weekends to not go to church. It wasn't what folk were comfortable with, but sometimes we actually came for the weekend. My name is Carlton Jones. My wife is a Florida girl, and so when I met her, we decided to move to Florida. My architectural partner, uh, Nat McCray, was building a house here, and he invited me to come up and look at it. So that was my first real introduction to American Beach. So I was so excited that I had my wife come with my daughter. And my daughter uh, fell in love with the beach lady. I mean, when I say in love, I mean in love. My daughter is artsy and very, you know, contemporary. So we met the beach lady. I, we, it was just an immediate connection. And my wife and I talked about it. We looked at a few lots. It was hard to get a lot up here. If you didn't know someone, uh, it was very difficult. And so we met um, uh, Miss Morgan, Emma Morgan. And she owned, at that time, most of the real estate. And she was sort of like a gatekeeper. And she and the beach lady were like this uh, on a lot of issues. Of course, the beach lady had the vision uh, Miss Morgan was a teacher, but also knew real estate very well and was very protective of the speech. And so we were able to buy a lot. I just felt a deep sense of place, and I always call it, it's a special place. It's our special place. Not that we have any ownership on it. My wife has traveled the world, and I've sort of followed her a little bit, but I've been to a lot of places. I never felt at home. It was always a vacation or a tour spot, but it just felt like this is where we were going to retire, and that's what we have done. Love the town and the community and just everything about American Beach. I am Carol J. Alexander. I would describe my connection with American Beach as a spiritual, ancestral calling. I grew up in Philadelphia. The only beach that we could go to was Atlantic City, but only a part. It was called Chicken Bone Beach. Chicken Bone Beach was always very spiritual to me because while all the kids played, I went to that Atlantic Ocean and I'd be by myself and just bask in the sun and the ocean and hear the motion of the ocean. And in 1981, I moved here with the, my late husband, got a job in Jacksonville and his company, Blue Cross and Blue Shield, brought him to what is 
it used to be called the Amelia Island Plantation. I began to walk and I found myself on the beach with my nine month old baby wrapped around my back and we were kicking and he wanted to, you know, get his feet near the sand. And I remember bending over and looking up down the shore. It was almost like I saw something come out the ocean, but I'm unwrapping him and putting him down. And the image kept coming closer and closer. And I looked up and somebody said, hey, baby, just let him sit. And that was, I didn't even know the name of where I had walked was American Beach. And I met who became the grandmother of my then, after being here, three kids, um, was Maveen Oshun Betch, the beach lady. And that first day, I just began talking to someone that I knew before. <laughs> someone that I knew before. And um, I kept coming here and coming here from Jacksonville. She was the first person that I had met here, only person that I knew, the only person that talked my language, looked like I looked, moved like I moved, and loved my baby. <laughs> so I continued to come here and it became a part of my life, my first child's life. Then I got pregnant again. She said, baby, you need to come on up here and it would help the pregnancy. And she taught me how to ease the stress of pregnancy and the swells of the ocean that was really warm. And I would sit there while she played with my first son. And then my mother hadn't gotten here yet and she had to come to Jacksonville to take care of the first son while I was having the second son. <laughs> and then it kept going to the third and the beach, was a part of my, really my growing into adulthood. I got here when I was probably, what, 27, 28-ish. And uh, I'm an old woman now still coming to the beach because <laughs> it does something to you. And the reason I mentioned Chicken Bone Beach, when my mother first got here, she reminded me that we would come to South Carolina to relatives who always said, you know, there's a black beach and black people own it. And we always thought that if we got enough money, we could come from South Carolina to Florida to the black beach where black people owned it. And then I realized later when she got here that it was American Beach. The ancestors brought me here. Abraham Lincoln Lewis is a major figure. Folk will call him a race man, a term used back in the day and still today to describe an individual who is centered in their African-Americanness, an individual who is committed to the ongoing struggle for justice for black folk the son of enslaved individuals who had been freed. Look at the year when he was born, 1865, in Madison County, Florida. And so it's not a strange thing that his parents, Robert and Judy Lewis, named him Abraham Lincoln Lewis. Throughout his life, he preferred not to be called Abraham Lincoln Lewis. And so he was known as A.L. Lewis. From those incredibly humble, challenging times, he did manage to get an elementary school education. And then he began to let that entrepreneurial spirit that was so inside of him take over. This young man by the name of A.L. Lewis went on to become Florida's first black millionaire. And the way that it happened, I have to believe, was directed by the good Lord and by the ancestors. Six black men came together with A.L. Lewis and they founded the Afro-American Life Insurance Company, the first 
insurance company, not the first black insurance company, the first insurance company in the state of Florida. Years later, as a young anthropology student, I read about something in Africa called the Susu, where in a West African village, folk would come together, put in their meager resources, and when someone needed those resources, the resources would go to that individual and that individual's family. That was the fundamental idea of the Afro-American Life Insurance Company. And certainly among these six men, these seven men, when we had A.L. Lewis, there was a deep Christian notion that doing for others is just the rent you gotta pay for your room on earth. And they took that to the level of a business. A.L. Lewis, who my sister, the beach lady, and I call Fafa. I was born in 1936. He passed in 1947. And so for those 10 years of my life, I knew Fafa as the superintendent of the Sunday school at Mount Olive A.M.E. Church. I knew that on Sundays, if we were not coming to the beach, the beach lady and I, little kids, knee out to a duck. We would go to the home of A.L. Lewis on Sugar Hill, and there his second wife, Elzona Lewis, would prepare Sunday dinner. A.L. Lewis was deeply religious, and he said to us, you cannot play any game on Sunday except regular school and Sunday school. So the beach lady and I got real creative. And at some point, he would often come by. And then he would say, tell me about the three Bs. We so adored him. We so respected him. And so one of us would do the performance and say, Fafa, we will live our lives by the three Bs because they are the three books of importance in our lives. The Bible, the school book, and the bank book. <laughs> in which case, Fafa would give us an applause. And because Abraham Lincoln was on a bill, sometimes we would actually get the bill. Fafa, a man of enormous proportions, who was so profoundly humble, at the Afro on every Friday at the end of the week, all of the employees would come together for a devotional service. And on many an occasion, someone would read from Micah, his favorite passage, with the question, what doth the Lord require of thee? And so A.L. Lewis, this humble, dignified race man went on to do so much good. I must reference his relationship with a race woman by the name of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. They had an amazingly close, professional, collegial relationship. As he assisted her, as she built what is now, hmm, Bethune-Cookman University. She assisted him with Edward Waters College, now a university. They sat on each other's boards. And indeed, I know that my sister friend, Carol Alexander, is now doing the research that shows that extraordinary relationship between a race man, A.L. Lewis, and a race woman, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. Abraham Lincoln Lewis, A.L. Lewis. When I listened to his great-granddaughter, Janetta Cole, describe him, she describes him with all of the accolades and honor, but most of all, this passion and emotion. And I, as one who has done a lot of research, I have come to know him. Yes, as Janetta described her great-grandfather as a race man, I would say that. 
I would also describe him as a man that had an aura because people, not just the family, people in the community of Jacksonville who remembered him, described this man that walked into a room and he took up the space in the room. He had aura. I uncovered some information about the yellow fever epidemic here in Jacksonville that killed a lot of people. And just like now in this era of COVID where black folk disenfranchised, they're the ones that did not have a lot of the health care and on and on. Same happened during that time of yellow fever. A.L. Lewis, and this is my interpretation of findings, he didn't write this. A.L. Lewis was an AME, African Methodist Episcopal, founded in my hometown, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay, I just had to put that part in the story. And the AMEs were an early church that had a benevolent society. People of the church helped people in need. A.L. Lewis was AME. And that was their kind of principle and, and, and doctrine that he took up. And during the yellow fever epidemic, he was also a part of the Black Masonic Order, Prince Hall. And they had an organization for the women called Household of Ruth. And the local one, he was behind the Household of Ruth that collected money. This is before the Afro-American Life Insurance Company that collected money for the people in the community. So if something happened, if you got sick or, or you needed burial expense, you would get money back. He started early. The commitment of the principles of his religious order, and he continuously taught that in the Sunday school, I'm thinking. And he, with the other six men, began some years later with the Afro-American Industrial and Benefit Association in 1901. And it's interesting to me that they called it Afro-American when we were colored and Negro and all other names that describe the, the beauty of my people. They connected themselves to their roots, Africa. Afro-American Industrial and Benefit Association. It began in 1901, and six, and, and six months later, the city of Jacksonville burnt down. They all had their assignments in this insurance company, and when the city burnt down, yes, their office did too, but their secretary, Eartha M. M. White, ran to the office, grabbed the files, and ran towards the fire, on the other side of the fire to get to A.L. Lewis's house and said, we got to continue our company. He then became the president of the company, but his focus was about the people of the city of Jacksonville, being able to have things and being able to support them because laws did not allow that to happen. And within the company, when he became president, he would bring the employees up to a place called Franklin Town on Amelia Island. It was a place that was incorporated after the plantation owner, the Harrison Plantation, gave its African slaves land, and they called it Franklin Town, after a man that was named Franklin Town. And he would bring them here for times to have the company employees and their families have recreation and relaxation. And then he thought we should have our own land and property and he investigated and he wanted a place for quote recreation and relaxation without humiliation. He led the pension bureau of the Afro-American Life Insurance Company that he started with a vision, and this pension bureau bought the first 33 acres of this land that we now sit on. I believe A.L. Lewis first stood on that dune and looked down and smiled because he was able to bring people at a time when, in Jacksonville, there was actually an ordinance for Jacksonville Beach that said, 
No white people or colored people can be with a hundred yards of each other on this beach. We could only go on a beach one day a week. But A.L. Lewis stood on that dune, I'm sure, and said, we can be on this beach Monday through Sunday. But his aura allowed the people who would come from Jacksonville on buses and cars and people from South Carolina, far north if they came down to come to a place of freedom, a place on the same ocean, on this island, where they dumped us from over on the other side of that ocean, on the west coast of Africa, to here, to be enslaved. He did something on this ocean that was in reverence to the God that said, soon and very soon, <laughs> soon and very soon, you shall have freedom and you will get what you deserve. There's something else about A.L. Lewis that's not often spoken about. And I want to be very respectful of what I know as opposed to what I would like it to be. But as I think about my great-grandfather, I think there is substantial evidence that he believed that the good Lord, she, made women and men. And he believed in a kind of equality between women and men. I say that based on his relationships. I say that based on what we know about his relationship with Mary Samus Lewis, his first wife, who, by the way, was a member in good standing at Bethel Baptist Church. And A.L. Lewis was an AME. There was nothing in that household where he, the man, said, you will come to my church. That's a man who respected Mary Samus Lewis's own sense of where God wanted her to be. His relationship with Eartha White. It wasn't a relationship of Eartha White bowing to A.L. Lewis. It was an egalitarian relationship. Look at his relationship with Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune, the letters between them. It was an egalitarian relationship. I witnessed his relationship with Alzona Lewis. That too was what my husband, James David Staten Jr. and I call a democratic marriage. And so as Sister Museum Director Carol Alexander digs more and more into the historical and her historical records of American Beach, of the Beach Lady, and certainly of A.L. Lewis, I'm convinced we will see even more evidence that A.L. Lewis respected, supported women.